And thank you for staying with us. This is still Plus Politics on and just concluded President Mahmoud Bari's speech on extended lockdown against the curtailing and forestalling of COVID, the spread of COVID-19. Joining me live in the studio is political analyst Tubosu Akeju. Thank you, Tubosu, for joining us. Thank you for having me. And we still have standing by on Skype, Mr. Gbolaba, political analyst. Thank you, Mr. Gbolaba, for staying with us still. Thank you for the opportunity, Steve. All right, quickly, I, I want to ask you this. Now, what, what measures do you think the federal government and should, have, should, should have put in place better than what is obtainable right now that, that could have been an alternative to this lockdown, this cessation order, given um, looking, looking at countries around the world and what they were able to do and our peculiar situation? As at this juncture, any responsible government on the face of the earth must listen to the scientists. The science of the management of this pandemic is still speaking to a global lockdown. The country that I used to allude to before, Japan, that refused to do a total lockdown but emphasized to accentuated the importance of people having their noses and their mouths covered on going out, and a very pronounced hygiene methodology of consistent washing of hands or sanitizing hands. That country, in the last three days, has been having a negative flip of the numbers that are now being positive. Now, as I'm talking to you now, an argument that has been imminently made on a TV program last week, that the country should be allowed to have a more, a, a, a predisposition more to social distancing and consistent hygiene, washing of hands, and no covering, no mouth covering in public places, that argument has been weakened by the scenario that has presented itself in the last two days in Japan. So I'm sitting there now thinking, science, global science. Look at the politicking that is going on in America now. The president wants to, uh, the president is already teasing his public that he may want to reopen the economy. The governors, including Repo Republican governors, are congregating against him to let him know that he does not even have that power in the American, in, in the American Constitution, that the power to reopen the economy is incumbent on them. So let's be very practical. Although, as a society, we have been so mismanaged that we have ne we, we never prepared for this. This government, especially is now facing the reality of a magnificently lost opportunity because this was the government. Since I have been following political, political developments in Nigeria, this was the government that initiated a more comprehensive social welfare package in the National Social Investment Program. But between its period of the election last year and as we speak now, that vehicle that it has developed for three years up until the re-election of the president has been so, so undermanaged that it is almost like it's not there. That is why it's sounding strange to most Nigerians when the president is mentioning that he has a social welfare list. Mr. Gbalaba, political analyst, thank you for staying with us and for your time and for your contributions. Thank you for the opportunity. And please do stay Goodbye. safe out there. We should say. All right. Tumos, let me come to you quickly. You did watch um, the presidential address um, on the extension of the lockdown by the president. Yeah. I, I just need your holistic view about it all. I mean, this was anticipated, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Yeah. And I think it's a step. Uh, it's a step in the right direction. Uh, if you look M at Many Nigerians would disagree with you on this now. So, okay. so sometimes what, is, what we want is not what is good for us. But when you look at the numbers of um, you know, identified cases in Nigeria, and you look at the growth and the recovery rates, it's better for us to make the sacrifice now, you know, and have the benefit later. Nigeria cannot cope 
you know, with any situation where our already very, very um, um, weakened um, health infrastructure is stretched or stressed in any way. So it's the best thing to do right now is to still ask everybody to stay back at home. Having said that, I think that government needs to be very conscious of the in unintended consequences of asking people to stay at home. 65% um, of the Nigerian GDP is from the informal and gig sector. So you're talking of you know, something as friendly as Uber and you know, all the ride alien businesses to something as you know, um, small or you know, distant as something like bricklayers. All of that has been shut down. So in the last 14 days, people in that space have not been able to earn a living in Lagos, Abuja, and Ogun State. So there, there, there's a significant impact to that. But that doesn't stop us from also realizing the fact that if you ask everybody, you know, if you lift this lockdown at this moment, you're going to start having community infections. And once yeah, which, the which case... Has been, which has been a fear in, yes. in days. Yes, once you know, the case this gets... Is a, this is a... Two, two months. Let's consider the, the, the impact of this economically. We'll come to the security aspect of this. Uh, we're a nation of over 180 million people. Yeah. And over 86 million of those 180 people live in extreme poverty by the Poverty and World Index. And Nigeria is like, we're, we're, down, we're down the ladder. And for most of these people, their daily, their, their, their daily sustenance is from what they can get daily. Their livelihood is from their daily means to, yeah. to feed themselves. Yes. Now, I mean, if you go, if you go on our streets, um, the crannies, the corners, boys are already coming out to the streets. Yeah. This already pose a threat security wise. Yeah. And now this, there is an extension for another two weeks. Yeah. What, what do you think might play out here? Um, yeah, there's a potential for breakdown of law and order. Mm. And, and uh, since we already know that that's most likely going to happen, then I think that the best thing is to start to put plans in place, you know, to stop that from happening. But we need to also be conscious of the fact that those people who are more likely to, you know, uh, be very unruly to break the law are not really, really the people in the abject poverty bracket. So I make an analogy. If you have, if you're having headache. You know, you know, your head is aching you at any point in time. The next action will not be to cut off the head. We have an unprecedented situation globally, and scientists are coming to terms. You know, trying to understand how this, how some people are asymptomatic, and some people from you know day three, you know, are showing very, very serious symptoms. We need to pull back and look at the things we can control. We can control reaching eight to six. But, but even people, but even in the last yes, but even the last virus. two weeks, even the last two weeks, the first decision ordered, not so much of this was being was being um, obeyed. We saw people in our streets. We saw cars. We saw people in, in departmental stores, in in pharmacies. I mean, yes. because you put a decision order in place. I mean, and. Those people need to be patronized. The supermarkets need to be patronized. Yeah. The pharmacies need to be patronized. Yes. Who are these people that should patronize them? You, the you, same people you're saying they shouldn't go about. I don't that, think yeah. that's very, very accurate. Yes. You know, before now, it used to really, really bother me that we had supermarkets at, you know, the new and crannies of our street. And I keep asking, when you walk into those supermarkets, you find out that, you know, a good number of what they have on your shelves are imported things. And I'm saying, why are we building a lot of malls and stores and supermarkets and we don't have the factories producing the things that are on the shelf? But guess what? It has become very, very useful to us now. Why? Because I can drive five minutes from my house and get to one or two supermarkets. The reason the supermarkets and the pharmacies are open is because people can go there and purchase essentials. And the and I tell you, it's a bit, you know, you'll be surprised how people are keeping to the rules of social distancing in those supermarkets. You have to literally... Not, not all of them, though. I, 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 the, I will the say few, that to the you. Not all of them, to, The yes. few I've been to... And which is, the major, which is a major concern still, so I think you know? That, again, going yeah. back to the issue, if what we understand is how to control people in supermarkets, if what we understand is how to keep people at home, if what we understand, if the challenge and the task in front of our in front of government today is to identify the 86 million people and growing, you know, that we need palliative. And mind you, you'll be absolutely surprised what it will take, 
you know, to ease the pain of those people who have not earned in the last 14 days and who are not going to be able to earn in the next 14 days. But, but there, there are food distribution going on in some certain centers now. And then on. the president just added another additional 1 million people yes. to the already 2.5 million Nigerian households. Yeah. How much of that can actually solve the problem right now? So, people are definitely hungry. Now, there is a pandemic to deal with. We can't totally trivialize that. Yes. And then we have a huge number of people who basically need to fend for themselves and yeah. eat daily. Not yes. everybody is as privileged as you might be or some other people might be out there or even the president exactly. himself. Yes. You know, it's all. Now, the, 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 the problem, the dichotomy here now is how do they obey this cessation order and still be able to fend for themselves before this distribution, before this food gets to them, that is if it will get to them. You see, so this is my approach. Let's be very, very much solution oriented, you know, and look at, and I'm working with quite a number of um, corporate organizations to see how we can reach the people who genuinely, you know, will require food and how much food do these people really genuinely need in the space of about 14 days. Each household probably don't need more than food of about 10 to 15,000. When you do the numbers, you know, that is nothing compared to what you know um, the corporate bodies in Nigeria can easily come up with and I said it to one of my friends I said see before the lockdown if you said that there was going to be a lockdown but it was not time to pay my guard but I gave him money and said go and stock up so that you're yeah. not stranded so I think that the onus is on each and every one of us as Nigerians corporate citizens you know to come it is a situation in US, in other countries. The factories that are manufacturing cars have come to the aid to start to produce things that are needed, you know, in hospitals. We've not gotten to that stage in Nigeria. We don't wish to get to that stage, but at the stage we are, if what we need to do is for all of us to come together and start to fix the pain and start to reduce the pain of those who people who can't earn, you know, those people who are unable, you know, to fend for themselves, then let us pursue that. And now quickly, stop, towards, yeah, we're running out of time, but I, I need to have your take. The, the security implication of this extended lockdown, quickly, if you can. Let, let's, let's look at it again, now from every angle. Again, yes. you know, and, and given the presence of our attack, the yes. military men and tax force on the road, I and how, how they fed in the, in the last two I weeks think, of this lockdown. I think that if they want to work, they always work. That's all I'm going to say. If they really want, you know, the, you know the flashpoints, you know the areas you should be worried about, you know. Prevention, and we're talking about it on, on, on the group of, um, uh, for my estate, and we're saying that sometimes just putting deterrence in place by the fact that, you know, a criminal mind sees a camera or that there are CCTVs around your building can deter that person from coming. The security agencies, they know what to do. I think government should put pressure on them to do the things that they need to do are we saying we're going to, uh, uh, it won't happen? No, it will happen, but let's ensure that we've put everything into it so that when it happens, we can nip it in the bud quickly. Tumbo Suakeju, thank you very much for joining us thank and for your me. contribution. Yeah. And thank you for staying with us. We'll take a short break now, and when we return, I'll be giving you my take. Stay with us. With an estimated population of one, over 180 million people and over 86 million of this population living in extreme poverty. Now, according to the report by the World Poverty Clock in Nigeria, the extended stay-home order has its side effects, definitely, especially on the poor population. Now, most of the people who belong to this category have only got a means of daily survival, and for them, COVID-19 could only make their pitiable condition worse. Hence, there have been several reported cases of clashes between the people and the military officers on patrol enforcing the stay-home order, which have resulted in fatal injuries and even death in some cases. And we can only hope this doesn't escalate into anarchy. The reason for this is not far-fetched. These people can only survive on daily economic activities, which are now shut down due to the prevailing pandemic. A desperate situation sometimes requires or demands a desperate response. This is probably the situation the global community has found themselves, more especially with regard to containing the raging pandemic, and Nigeria is no exception. The government should carefully manage the situation with greater considerations for the population of the people living in extreme poverty who may be experiencing a double tragedy at the moment of not being able to go about their daily livelihood and being vulnerable to contracting the deadly COVID-19. The government should not be oblivious of the economic realities created by the outbreak of coronavirus. Hence, the effective management of the situation and the people must be top priority. 
In a desperate situation, people sometimes get pretty desperate for survival, not because they're bad, but because they're human. And like the saying goes, a hungry man is an angry man. Albeit, the Nigerian government is said to be distributing some relief materials, in some cases giving money in the form of cash to the poor. In as much as this is a good and commendable gesture, the following questions come to mind. Is there a realistic plan on how to utilize the billions of Naira donations for the purpose of fighting coronavirus? How does the government plan to reach out to every Nigerian who is currently in need or may be in need of relief materials, considering the fact that the home stay order is two weeks, which is no guarantee for completely flattening the curve of COVID-19? Indeed, the times are uncertain. But the burden rests on the government to deal hope and repose confidence in the citizens of its ability to be on top of this matter and safeguard them by every means necessary. This has been Plus Politics. Thank you for staying with us and join me again same time tomorrow. I am Benny Ark. Do stay safe and have a good evening.